Well, good morning and welcome to the Father's Day weekend edition of Bumper to Bumper Radio. We're glad you could join us. I'm Matt Allen along with my good friend Dave Riccio, and we're your KTAR car guys here every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on 92.3 KTAR. We're here helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. So if you've got car questions, car problems, maybe a prospective car purchase you want to talk about, we've got answers. So we encourage you to give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And don't be shy. Just call in and get involved. Nobody can see you. So it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, Gonculator Valves. Twin chrome canooters and open phones, of course, as always, and overheating. Why you don't want to have that happen to you or your car, for that matter. Uh, it's bad, but, you know, we see in people on the side of the road now, hoods up. Uh, yeah, when it gets smoking hot like this, the boiling over car is something you'd normally see. It's probably one of the most preventable repairs or preventable things you can prevent is overheating. But it is one of the most costly things that happens if your car overheats and you don't shut the car down right away. You can do major engine damage, and those are the biggest repair bills in the auto shop. Come, you know, May, June, July, August. You know, by August, I guess they're all they're all fizzled out. But it's so preventable not to overheat your car. We want to talk about that because we want to save you money when it comes to not facing those big repairs. So here I am driving on the freeway. All of a sudden, my car decides to overheat. How do I know it's overheating, Matt? Well, yeah. If, well, you don't know it's overheating. That's part. Of, sometimes the problem, and I, I guess the most obvious would be the gauge is going up to the hot mark or somewhere into the red. We might call it. People say my gauge, my gauge pegged. That's the most obvious, and you don't want to get the car shut down. But you've got to be careful because if you've got a leak or something, that gauge isn't going to necessarily read because there's no water to transfer heat. So the gauge is the most obvious symptom. Uh, red what, lights, red lights, warning lights, noises. Sometimes you know we get bad gas, or you get a pinging noise. But boy, when a car starts getting hot, that engine's rattling, <laughs> especially when you try to accelerate a little bit. Well, there's two types of overheat. So there's a car that's running warm or above the normal temperature, and that may be from being a little bit low on coolant, something like that. But then there's the catastrophic overheat where the radiator hose blows off or the radiator bursts. That's the one that's going to get you in a lot of trouble when you're driving on the road because you're not going to know it's going to happen right away you know hopefully there's some steam or some sign because we don't want to keep driving that car when you run the engine in the overheated state uh, that's when the damage to the head gasket that's the most common thing that goes on and that's a big repair you don't want to face well well yeah and, that, and like you said when you have that kind of of a catastrophic failure a hose blows or a radiator tank or something like that breaks you're not going to have the coolant that's the case where you don't have the coolant in the engine to uh, to make that gauge work. So that's where, you know, you've really just got to be aware of your car, the normal sounds that it makes and the odors. You you know, you have a little bit of a coolant leak. You might have a sweet smell. Uh, well, the other thing, too, is if, if you got low coolant or, or there's the car's starting to run warm, let's not take the catastrophic, it's starting to run warm, you might feel your air conditioning warm up. It's not blowing as cold. Even though they're two different systems, they actually use the same electric fan a lot of times to cool the engine and the cooling engine cooling system as well as the condenser in the air condition. So if you have a, a, a car that's running warm, so maybe you're used to seeing the gauge kind of halfway between the C and the H, cold and hot, and all of a sudden it's up three-quarters of the way, well, hey, maybe in the air conditions blowing a little bit warmer, maybe it's something we need to be looking at. Yeah, there's that. Um, uh, leaks. Leaks, and, and that's where you get a little bit of a smell from. Uh, but, but and, and that's the classic symptom of, of, like, the radiator fan that you're talking about is the car is cool, and then you come to the stoplight. It warms and it up. it starts to warm up. We had one in the shop just the other day, a Honda. She says, well, it's great going down the road, but as I come to a stop, the car starts to warm up and the air conditioner isn't as cold. So we find some perspective or po po overheating problems that are about to start happening in the course of doing air conditioning service and diagnosis sometimes as well. Because they're not as tuned in to the way the engine's running. But you can feel the but, air but, conditioner. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> when, when it starts warming up. There's, uh, you know, we're we're all in touch with our air conditioner. Well, you talked about leaks and coolant smell, kind of a sweet smell. I I can't walk through a parking lot and not tell you which car smells because it's just something I'm I'm used to. But leaks, people don't spot leaks anymore because they used to see the green coolant on the ground. 
you know, green meant engine coolant. Well, half of it's not green anymore. And at a transmission shop, Tri-City Transmission, someone comes in saying, oh, my transmission's leaking, my transmission's leaking. Because well, it's red. Because <laughs> it's red. Red, and right? Transmission coolant, or fluid was always red, and coolant now, a lot of it is red. So you see red fluid on the ground. You could be thinking engine coolant as well as transmission. Well, as a matter of fact, we were, uh, I was checking with one of the guys. We were using a vacuum tool to, to draw the coolant into the, to the engine now. We don't just pour it out of the jug. And I, I said, what are you, why are you putting clear water in? Oh, no, that's Ford Gold coolant. I mean, it's the 50-50 mixture. It looks just like water. At least it did in a, in a in a white bucket. We're pulling that out of a five gallon bucket when we mix it. So everyone's going to be different. No one can standardize. It drives us nuts in our business. Yeah, the, Ford's got to do it one way. So Toyota the other way. Green, pink. You got a light pink or a red. Uh, there's blue. Honda's got blue. BMW's blue. So you see these different colors, but you don't see the leaks necessarily under the car either because of all the shields and protective uh, undercarriage plastics and covers and such. So you've Well, we've talked about the two different kind of overheats, a catastrophic overheat where something bursts and all the coolant comes out. And then we've also talked about the more mild overheating or maybe it was a little low on coolant, that type of thing. Some of the other reasons, we talked about the electric fan. Most of your front-wheel drive cars have electric fans. Uh, Most rear-wheel drive cars have a a fan that turns off the engine pulley or the crankshaft. uh, Water pump. Water pump uh, type, type also. So there's... One of the things that we see on the ones that it's not a catastrophic failure, but the cars are warm, is a plugged radiator. So the radiator d- develops sediment in it, so it's not cooling as effective. So you're going to see the gauge kind of creep up. Yeah, the radiator with, with just the hard the, – it's so important to keep the original coolant good. I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but that's the one, re- one of many reasons we want to keep a good radiator cap on the car is to keep air out of the system – keep the pressure up, which you really want to have the pressure up to keep the car from boiling. But it used to be with the decks cool in the engines, and now all the coolant's really, you've got to have a good pressure cap or contaminants get in, and, it, and, and that radiator will start to plug up. Usually you don't see that on a, say, a 50,000-mile, 60,000-mile engine. It's, it's the higher mileage ones where somebody else has done a cooling system flush, and we've got horrible water. Rosie was talking about the water in, in Arizona today. You take tap water out and use regular tap water in your radiator. That is it's full that, of rocks in a sense. Yeah, dissolve yeah, solids. Yeah, basically. So that that radiator is just over time will, will plug solid. So we use we use demineralized water. You can use um, what is it? Not reverse. You don't want to use reverse RO water, but. Uh, I'm drawing a blank here, Dave. Yeah, the, I'm not uh, helping you out. You just want to use good water. The, 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 the <laughs> gallon of water you buy at the store. Distilled the, water. Distilled that's water. the word there you're you looking go. for. It, you know, that's what you want to be using in your iron at home and stuff. You know, it doesn't have all that calcium and all, all the hardened or dissolved solids that are in it that will build up and actually plug up the radiator. Well, let's talk about radiators because radiators are a big reason cars come in on tow trucks. You know, tow trucks backing up. Dee, dee, dee. You know, it just sounds expensive. <laughs> but uh, radiators being a big part. And sometimes, you know, radiators, if you're going to keep a car for 10, 15 years, you know, long time, 100,000, 150,000 miles, uh, you are going to put a radiator in the car. So do you put the radiator in the car when it decides to burst and give out? You know, in the old days, they had metal tanks, so they would develop leaks. The modern radiator has plastic tanks, so they just give out. So when you're doing some of the 100,000-type mile maintenance on your car, you may consider replacing the radiator at the same time because we have to remove the radiator to get, let's just take the uh, Audi timing belt. You know, we're going to pull the whole front clip off the car, including the radiator, to get to that timing belt. Why not replace the radiator now? It's got 100,000 miles on it. Well, yeah, you know... The ra- yeah, because the radiator is not going to outlast the work that you've just done. So you have the you know you can use the economies economies of scale, so to speak, and take advantage of the labor. You know, but a long time ago, it's probably been ten years at least. The kind of the general rule of thumb, when after they started coming out with these plastic radiators or plastic tanked radiators with an aluminum core, was after ten years or a hundred thousand miles, we wouldn't even attempt to fix them. It just didn't make sense. Maybe it didn't become cost effective no. anymore to and rot them out. And no, and there used to be radiator shops where you could go and you'd buy one tank and you'd replace the tank on the radiator. But then you had the dilemma, well, if this tank blew, now you've got half the radiator is still no good or, or has the possibility of having a failure. So it, sometimes it just makes sense, and it's worth having that discussion. 
When we come back, we've got Carol, Monique, and Ron and a couple open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen, and we are taking phone calls at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And today we're talking about overheating, how not to overheat, why you don't want to overheat, why it's a bad thing. But real quickly, I want to give a shout-out to my dad, Dennis Riccio, and say happy Father's Day. If I don't talk to you tomorrow, way to go, Dad. <laughs> yeah, you're going to go on hiding. And me too. I'm pretty sure my dad's listening on the TuneIn Radio up in Nevada, Tom. So uh, happy fa- – I never call him Tom. That's weird. No. <laughs> <laughs> happy it's, Father's Day. I call my dad Daddy, but don't tell anybody. I call mine Pa. Pa. Okay. pa. And the girls call me Papa. <laughs> so just well, my thing, you know. Well, I don't know that we got to it last segment, but we wanted to get to it, is that if your car overheats, don't – try and just limp it to the next place you know people say oh you can turn the heater on to kind of cool the engine down and all that if the car is a catastrophic overheat shut it down pull it over by all means if you're not somewhere safe yeah go ahead and go ahead and get out of that unsafe place but most time you're not pull over you're gonna you know sometimes if it's a head gasket and i'll just take a a honda civic some of the guys do a bad head repair to roughly you know a thousand dollars but a good repair you know with radiator and hoses and water pump and all that stuff you're talking maybe eighteen hundred dollars two thousand dollars twenty two hundred dollars that's the kind of repair that you face if you ignore an overheat or try and limp it out and you're talking about a fifty dollar tow bill you know for sure so don't do that. And then the other thing Matt was bringing up is that the first thing people do when their car, the red lights turn on, is they pull over and they open the hood and they stare at it. <laughs> I think it's just what you're supposed to do, I guess. It's I, just a rite of passage, right, when your car breaks down. But what, do you, what, what are we going to fix? Don't go taking the, the radiator cap off. That's probably the worst thing you can do yep. when a car is hot. you got to realize that, that that system is under pressure, and that's what's keeping it from boiling is the pressure like a pressure cooker. As soon as you open it up to atmosphere, man, it's going to come out of there like a volcano. Severely dangerous. You're, you're talking major burns. So that for sure. Yeah, I mean, we were laughing because I thought, you know, you always <laughs> see the people stand there looking. That typical a guy in a suit or, or a woman. And I, and I said, if I break down, I'm not going to bother opening the hood because there's nothing I can. I mean, and I know what I'm doing. And there's, <laughs> there's not a darn thing I can do standing there on the side of the 51. It's all trivial at that point. You know, it's like uh, getting a safe spot. But even if you make it home, like you said, Dave, a tow bill, people say, well, well I think I can fill up and make it to your shop. Don't do no, it. No, no, no. Don't just, do just, it. You know, just, you're taking a small bill, making it a big bill, totally preventable. So, and the other thing is when when your, your relationship tells you, hey, you're starting to get a seep at your radiator, your hoses are looking rough, don't just say, oh, he's trying to sell me something. Because you know what? He may be trying to save you a big repair bill, you know, down the road. You don't want a radiator hose to blow off and cost you 2000 bucks. Well, and back to the towing thing. If you're worried about having a $50 tow bill or a $90 tow bill, tow trucks are expensive and fuel is expensive. And, and those guys, it, it can be an expensive venture to tow. Call your insurance company. Call your insurance agent. That's the best kind of road service to get is the one through your insurance. Yeah, I would push and, personal insurance for sure on that. And, and call your agent. A lot of people that we see get towed in, they have it and they don't even know it. You're probably paying $2.50 a month for it on your policy. I don't think so it's you, that much. You don't need all the all the other road clubs and cards and stuff like that. So if you don't, if you know, if you're not sure if you have it, call your insurance agent on Monday and make sure you add road service. If you know you have it, then good. Stick with it on your road policy. Well, up first this segment, we are going to go with Carol in Phoenix on a 2004 Lexus. Go ahead, Carol. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Good morning. Uh, the car has just, I just put 74,000 miles on the car. I have had never, believe it or not, not one single problem with this automobile. The only thing we replaced it didn't need it, but it said after 70,000 miles, do it, so we did it, was the timing belt. So the last has always been handled by the, uh, the dealer. So the last time, a few weeks ago, we got the car back, and they have two little notations on here which says, valve cover gaskets are leaking, slightly leaking, at the left rear, and the other point is the transmission case seal is sweating. So what I'm wondering is, my husband is like, oh, no, this is a lifetime car. I'm not sure that's true. I'm wondering, should we be thinking of 
selling it or trading it, or mm, are we in for no. you know a that, big mess? Yeah, that car is an excellent car. I didn't ask what model it, but it's it's a Toyota. I mean, Lexus, Toyota. They're they're great cars. Uh, one of the things that I don't like. That we don't see enough in our business is people devi- defining the severity of a leak. Mm-hmm. And at Tri City Transmission, we came up with a scale of one to five, like a hurricane. Is it is it is it a scale five, or is it a one? And you know, a five is like an active leak, like a massive wound. And a sweat to me sounds like on a scale of one to five, it's like a one point five. I mean, it's just barely starting to seep a little bit. That's something I would monitor. You know. Yeah, that's what they said. But I'm wondering, is this leading to just a whole it's bunch a, of things? That no, no, no. It is absolutely not. Valve cover gaskets are, are a fairly common thing that we see. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's something that it's it's not a major repair. I don't know what if they give you any sort of estimate on it. And then as far as the transmission goes, a little bit of sweat or seep. And it depends on where that's coming from. There's a There's a pan gasket. That's going to be the most common no, place. she's talking about the valve cover gasket. No, she oh, talked about on the transmission. Okay. Oh, okay, there's yeah, a yeah. There's a pan gasket. Is, is it leaking from the pan gasket, the case seam, the front seal? There, there's about five different places it can leak. But I wouldn't be scared of the car at all. You know, Lexus was 75,000 miles on no it. No way. If this was television, you would have seen Dave and I doing hand signals, arguing over who could give their opinion and how to answer this <laughs> question. But the car is an infant in those terms. And, and again, that's the communication. It's sweating. We had this debate in our shop too about shocks leaking. Are they sweating? How much is normal? That car's not going to be brand new forever. But when does it develop to a problem? Sweating is not a problem. Mm. I would argue that there's probably more grease on the Pizza Hut box <laughs> than there than <laughs> that's there, true than there is on the on the transmission. Look for look for drips in your driveway and, and ask them to show you. Show me where this leak is. And again, we'll just monitor. But that car has got a lot, a lot of life, of good in time it. in it. In and it. and um, well, I think the yeah. fear is there. Is this is this going to turn into some big lemon? You know, and and no, it's not. Um, you know, take care of your car. Get get the maintenance. I don't think you need to be scared of it. Uh, we're talking today about overheating. You know, seventy five thousand miles on the car. You know, in the next year or two, you're going to start to do some more cooling cooling system work. You've done the timing belt, and you said you didn't really need it, and that's the way timing belts are replaced. You just replace them because eventually they go bad, and when they do, it's a bad thing. Yeah, and you know, the other thing too is is you is it depends on how you want to take care of your car. Carol, you could take that Lexus and probably not change the oil for the next five years and do nothing and ignore it, and it will probably still be a great car at some level. It depends. Just depends. It somebody else's trash is somebody else's treasure, but that would be an extreme. That car's not even close to being a problem. That that is a, a jewel for sure. Well, yeah, cooling system work. That's something you're going to be starting to see. You know, sixty thousand, eighty thousand, hundred thousand miles. Cooling system maintenance. How often match should that coolant be changed? Well, the manufacturers, this is where you always hear me say the marketing department talks about one thing and then reality is another. So you're going to see cooling system flushes or services that should be done at 100,000 miles. We typically recommend in this climate to cut those in half. At least start looking at them at 50,000 miles and maybe tie that out to another mileage interval. Maybe there's another repair and keep the coolant fresh and clean. But it's not like it used to be. Now, there are still some cars where it does need to be done every 30,000 miles. But there's all kinds of realm of possibility there. Well, when we come back, as Jill promised, we're going to tell you what a gonculator pump is. We've got Ron and Monique and Mike in open line at 602-277-5827. Bumper to bumper. I'm Matt Allen, and he's Dave Riccio, and we're bumper to bumper every Saturday 11. And uh, we're helping with your car today, talking about overheating. And uh, Father's Day weekend. I don't know what everybody's doing for Father's Day, but hope you're having fun. And Dave, I noticed you. You know, you have your your element that you like so much, and I know you put some wheels on it a few weeks ago. You're at the shop mounting them up, but today you had quite the, as I uh, I would say, bumping some notes out there uh, <laughs> when, when we pulled up. What, well, what it's Father's Day, and uh, my wife always wants, what do you want for Father's Day? Honey, please don't get me anything, because I'm going to do a good job by myself, something really nice. And uh, I you know, I wanted hand, hands-free in my car. My 2011 Element is not fancy enough for that. So I went down to a place called Sounds Good to Me in Tempe off Broadway, and uh, I had such a good experience, I would, thought I would give them a shout-out. They installed a stereo that does uh, hands-free, 
so I can talk on the phone and I can play my iTunes from my phone right into my stereo, which is just the coolest thing in the world. So, uh, you know. Well, I notice I can finally hear you when you're talking now because you've got the Bluetooth. Uh, oh, it's so nice. It's you know? so nice. And, you know, we talk about not texting and driving, and uh, this thing doesn't allow me to text and drive verbally, but uh, it's a bad idea anyway, according to AAA. They said texting and driving, even if it's a hand-free setup, is not good. I don't believe anything AAA says. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was whispering that. So uh, anyway, let's take Monique in Phoenix on a 2006 Chevrolet Impala. Go ahead, Monique. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes. Um, I replaced my tires about a week and a half ago. Um, the car has 83,000 miles on it. And now it's riding rougher than ever. I can feel every bump and crevice in the road. And I was just wondering, what could that be? Mm. Well, I, I got without my replacing the tires, I would say, one, you need to, I, I'm sure that the shop, I would imagine that they have the right tire pressures in the car. So first and foremost, that's what I would check the decal on the on the door or the glove box or the owner's manual. But typically you're going to find it on the inside of the driver's door on the door jam. There's going to okay. be a sticker that's going to have their tire pressure, appropriate tire pressure in there. Make sure the tire pressure is set. But, Dave, I don't know what you were thinking. We had a Honda in the shop the other day. We just did a regular transmission service on the car. And she came back and she said, this thing rides bumpy. And I thought, mm. well, maybe it was bumpy like a Cadillac, bouncy bumpy. I know where you're going with that. This thing was rigid. There was no suspension in the car at all. And the Honda CRVs are famous for when you lift them up, and we don't see this very often, but the the when you lift the car, the suspension is going to sag. Uh huh. So you start looking at well, what could it, it's not it's not the tires. What happens when you lift the car? What's the byproduct of something? Well, in this particular car, the the shocks went to their full throw or their full extension. extension and they just were not compressing anymore. I mean, they would. You'd let, set the car back down onto the, onto the ground from the lift, and there was a foot between the wheel well and the top of the tire. you go push it down, and it would go down you know, six or eight inches and settle, but there was no bump. There was no rebound. There was no jounce. There was nothing happening there. Well, the first thing that came to my mind on that was tire pressure. You know, maybe somebody put, uh, you didn't understand the, the pressure rating, maybe a rookie guy put on tires and put... 50 pounds in them where there's only supposed to be 30. That was the first thing that came to my mind. But that's a good point because that happens. People say, my car, what would you do to my car? It rides terrible now. Well, it's just a byproduct of being in the shop. It's not that the shop did anything wrong. Right. And what you're referring to, Dave, is the guy didn't understand the tire pressure rating. If you look on the side of the tire, it'll say something like max PSI is maybe, I'll make it uh, 200 pounds. Now, you would never want to put 200 pounds of pressure in your tire, but I'm just using that to make a point. It would say 200 pounds at whatever weight rating it is. And a lot of people will look at the tire and say, well, it said I could put that in. And, and realistically, it's more like 60 or something like that. But that's the maximum pressure that tire can withstand at the maximum load. The real pressure is what's on the door jam. So check that. And then take it back to the tire shop or whoever did the tires and just tell them what's happening. Tell them what you've noticed and see what they have to say. Thanks for the call, Monique. We've got Ron and Mike and a couple open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. We're going to go with Ron in Paradise Valley on a 94 Toyota Tercel. Go ahead, Ron. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, my car's not fancy either. So, um, basically, I have 180,000 miles on it, and the engine light finally came on. And I do a lot of driving, and that's why I have this car, because it gets 40 miles a gallon. Um, it leaks oil, and it even has a gas leak in it. Um, but I'm just driving it until it pretty much dies. And so I'm wondering, with the engine light on, is it safe to continue to drive until I get it in the shop? I put up probably 200 miles a day on it. Oh, wow. Now, when you say engine light, is that a red engine light or a yellow check engine light? Um, it's just a picture of the motor. It, what color is it? Oh, orange. It's an orange. So that, that's the check engine light. So okay. I think your question was, is it safe to drive? And, and yeah, it, it's safe to drive. That's not the most sophisticated system. That's the OBD-1 in the 94 car, not the OBD-2, which is the generation we're on right now for diagnostics. Okay. So you won't fail emissions because the light is on. You, you, uh, I don't think that one flashes if it's a misfire. So the computer has just detected something is out of range. So, yeah, it's something that should be checked. 
but you just said it yourself. It's it's kind of your you don't necessarily care about it. Or not, not that you didn't care about it. You're going to drive it till it dies. Well, if you want it to die quicker, just keep on ignoring it. But there's no reason to drive it till it dies. You could, you know, you can prevent it from dying a slow death, I guess, or or dying sooner. The but the one thing you said concerned me was the fuel leak. I think that's something you want to, you probably want to have somebody look at. Uh, probably get some better fuel economy if it's not leaking. But as far as the check engine light, that's one that you know, two hundred thousand miles. It's kind of a beater, I guess. But it's a black gonna, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but some. But he's gonna. He said he's gonna drive it into the ground. But is it? You know, the car's got one hundred eighty thousand miles on it, and we have cars that people say, you know, when is a car worn out? And I think that expectation has changed. You know, car used to be totally worn out at one hundred thousand miles, and now if people do good maintenance on a car, there's no reason you can't drive that car for two hundred thousand miles. It's certainly you're gonna have more money in your pocket by not going out and buying new cars all the time, unless of course you can just afford it. Well, and there's nothing wrong with getting a new car if you want a new car, but but. Uh, that that car now it's old. Well, it's not even old. I mean, no, it's <laughs> it's, it's twenty old. years old. It's still one hundred eighty thousand miles. He could. He said he wants to run it till it's in the ground. But you know, he's still probably got another hundred thousand miles to go. To yeah, be quite honest, depending on how yeah, depending on how you take care of it. But I'd at least get the fuel leak taken a look at, and the fuel leak could be part of the part of the check engine light, possibly. Um, again, not a real super sophisticated system on the ninety four, although it's still electronic fuel injection. It's got a lot of the similar controls and stuff that we have now, but but uh, not a breakdown and not going to fail emissions necessarily. Well, thanks for the call, Ron. 602-277-5827. We are going to go with Mike in Phoenix on a 2008 Ford F-150. Go ahead, Mike. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Yeah, it's the F-150 with the 5.4 Triton engine and the automatic. When I put it in reverse, at a low speed, like to do a three-point turn or to back a trailer into a parking spot, the thing starts dieseling really bad. The only way to get it to stop is put it in neutral, rev it up a little bit, and then it settles back down to normal. What do you mean dieseling? I always think, I think of dieseling like, like, as when like you the shut... engine's being lugged down. Well, I like think, that? It, I it, think... It, would, it would be almost like it's being lugged down, but it's an automatic. Um, normal stop and go traffic light, traffic light and stuff is just fine, smooth idle. But it's it's notice it's any time I stop to like reverse or back into a parking space, um, especially if there's any kind of load on, or like even in a parking garage downtown for a parking garage, three point turn into a tight space and it starts dieseling, rattling, clacking, knocking. I'm trying to get an, a feel for how bad the lugging is. Does it feel like? Do you see that? the tachometer go down to 500 rpm 300 rpm i was it really lugging down and does it feel like it wants to push you you know i i haven't looked at the tack because i'm more concerned with the noise and what's going on with the engine okay i mean i don't know i think i, I would kind of want to know the severity of the deal but it, it maybe sound like we've got a it's torque bad. converter clutch that's that's kind of hanging on trying to stall the engine because when you change it in you know neutral or drive it goes away correct well, correct so the, the fluid flow is a little different in reverse than it is in forward. So that's one of the possibilities that comes, comes to mind, but it's not what I would consider a pattern failure on that truck. It's not something I see on a regular basis. Yeah, I don't think it's an engine control problem or, or a runnability. It's something is, is like you yeah, said. Yeah, the engine doesn't care if it's in reverse or drive or neutral. I mean, it's just going to run, you know, other than the fact there's going to be load on it in reverse or drive. But I think we have a torque converter clutch that might be holding on a little bit there in reverse. So thanks so much for the call, Mike. Uh, 602-277-5827. We are going to go with Cameron in Tempe on a 91 Jeep Wrangler. Go ahead, Cameron. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Uh, hello? Yeah, go ahead, Cameron. You're up. I, I got a 91 Jeep. I got 150000 on it, and I had an um, electric fan conversion on it, and my fan went out, so I boiled it over, and now I put the new electric fan relay, so that's what uh, short it out, and now I keep overheating quite consistently. Is it a way have I like warped some of the uh, the uh, thermostat housings, and now it's starting to leak a little bit, or maybe my water pumps out of whack now? Is that a four liter? It is a four. Uh, no, it's yeah, four liter. Excuse me. Okay, you know it, there could have been. So, you know, how bad did you overheat it? Would you say was it? So- um, it, it steamed up. I, re- I, I realized it started to steam out of the sides of the of the hood, so I pulled over immediately, and the moment I turned the thing off, it, it, that's when the, uh, the pressure popped. Not popped the radiator cap off, but the fluid started to come out of the radiator cap. So it was coming out the side and boiling over into the yeah, tank? Yeah, boiled and... over. 
I don't think I blew like a gasket because I've done that. I did that in another vehicle, and I only overheat when I'm driving on highway speeds. Like when I drive in the city, consistent driving in the city for 10 miles, it's no real problems. But when I get up to about 55 for a consistent amount of time, that's when I start having problems. It starts, I hit uh, 235 and I'll pull off the freeway, I drive on the surface streets for about 10 miles, five miles, excuse me, and it'll cool back down. Do you have? Jump back on the freeway. A lot of people on the on those jeeps, they like to put like brush guards in the grill. Do you have anything like that installed? Brush guard? Yeah, uh, like a. It's no, kind I of like a. Winch. Right in the way, but other than that, there's nothing covering and nothing covering with the the radiator. Well, I think of the winch and the fan clutch, or I mean, some, some something blocking. You know, at higher speeds, it's not really getting air th- across the radiator. There's kind of a you know a vortex right there, I guess, and it's just not not making its way past. Yeah, but if there was no changes after the the fan went out, that's it's that's it's weird. Cool. Maybe there's some air, you know. It, but you mentioned water pump and thermostat housing. If they were leaking, if they're not leaking, they're probably not. The problem. I mean, I would imagine when you overheat it, maybe you put a thermostat in it. But your description of the symptom, the thermostat doesn't work differently at higher speeds versus lower speeds. You could have blown the head gasket. We've seen some Toyotas and had some challenging cars that were overheated, and then you know after the oh, the you know the leak or the radiator was fixed, you could get them and they you drive them seven or eight, ten miles, and then they would start to run hot. And uh, we have to do a cylinder leak down test or some other testing you can do to see if there's – what you want to do is check for hydrocarbons or basically exhaust coming out the radiator. When we come back, we've got a board full of calls. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, here along with Matt Allen on this Father's Day weekend. I like when they put it as a weekend and not just a day, you know? I get to be king of my castle for at least Friday afternoon it starts, Saturday. Close business Friday till uh, Sunday at midnight. <laughs> my wife disagrees, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's all weekend long. So anyway, glad you could join us. We are going to go right to Dennis on a 2000 Toyota Tundra. Go ahead, Dennis. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Oh, hi, guys. Um, thanks for taking my call. Um, yesterday, when I was driving down the road, that brake light on a dashboard comes on, and um, I pull over and I see the brake master cylinder is low on brake fluid. So I go to the auto parts store, and I fill it up. And about half hour later, the light comes on again, and I notice um, it's starting to lose um, fluid in the master cylinder. So when I got home, I looked under the truck uh, behind the backing plate of the drum brakes, and um, I saw no leaks, and I looked by the front calipers, and I found no leaks. And um, I pulled the carpet where the brake pedal is, and I found no leaks there either. But um, <clears throat> but by the brake master cylinder, you can hear like a, like a whistling noise. Okay. Well, that fluid's going somewhere. At mm-hmm. first, I was going to say, well, it's not abnormal to have the brake light come on and have the fluid be a little bit low. Because as the front brake pads wear out, you're going to you're gonna lose fluid. I mean, not lose fluid. The fluid level will change in the master cylinder, and you top it off a little bit. But the fact that you've lost fluid twice now, it was down, you filled it, and it came back, that fluid's going somewhere. So the first thing we would do is probably go peek at the front calipers, at the rear wheel cylinders, and see if you see any external leaks. You did that. Peeled the carpet back like a, like we would check a clutch master cylinder leaking, and the back seal of the, of the clutch master cylinder comes into the car, but on the brake it doesn't. It goes into the brake booster. So you very well could have a master cylinder that's leaking down into the brake booster if you have looked at each of the four corners and there's no fluid leaking there. One thing that you might do is also go in the truck with it running. Don't pump the brakes, but just... Put your foot on the brakes as you would at a stoplight and lightly apply pressure. Don't mash the pedal. Just hold the foot on the pressure and, and let it see if it drifts down to the floor. And you, I think what you're going to find is you have a, ma- a brake master cylinder that's bypassing, and then that fluid is probably leaking into the brake booster. I bet if you peel the, uh, the master cylinder, unbolt it from the brake booster, that thing's probably full of fluid. Yeah, I would go with that. Thanks for the call, Dennis. We are going to go with Jason on a 2000 Nissan Maxima. Go ahead, Jason. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. I, uh, I'm having a problem when I stop at a light. My air conditioning goes out, but I hear the fan running hard in the front. 
Uh, could that be the compressor? Could be. I mean, it not like if, does the AC blow cold most other other times while you're driving and everything else? When I'm yeah, when I'm driving, it takes a little bit to get going again, but it does blow very cold air. It's just any time I stop, it just slowly goes away. Now you can you said you can hear the fan running. Have you actually taken a look? Is there two fans on that, Matt? Um, a, I have not. I'm not taking a look. It definitely needs to get in and and get uh, some pressure gauges on it just to see if we've got the appropriate fill, and at the same time look at those cooling fans. Because, again, if it doesn't work at a stop but it works good once the car is moving, I am thinking cooling fans. And most cars have two cooling fans. So there's one that's always going to run, and then there's one that's going to kick on when the car's to a hotter temperature uh, or or when the uh, AC's, AC's on. on. Yeah, when the AC's on, they're both going to run. And when it's just the normal hot uh, warming cycle with the car mon- uh, uh, regulating the temperature, just one will run. But the other thing... We can have cars, and it's not uncommon to have them low on pressure. People say, gosh, I didn't think it was low. It was really cold. Well, yeah, when it's low on charge, sometimes it will get really cold, and that pressure drops down. It goes into the low cycle or low pressure cycling switch, and the AC shuts off. And it, Maybe it's getting too cold or the pressure's too low because it's low on charge, but it was still able to make cold air while you're driving. So it could be a low charge issue, but... Part of an air conditioning service is making sure that those fans are working. Now, you may have to do some testing to find out why they're not working if you find that one of those fans is not working. But I would start with a charge issue. And a place to do that is any one of the bumper-to-bumper radio shops that you can find at bumper-to-bumperradio.com. Well, thanks for the call, Jason. We're going to go with Brian in Mesa on a 1995 Chevrolet S10. Go ahead, Brian. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Good morning, guys. Um, a little off topic today. I know you guys are doing cooling systems, but um, I have three very high mileage older vehicles that um, I've got a lot of varnish on the inside on the parts and wanted to ask you about a good oil flush, or do you recommend that? Well, first thing on the being off topic, anybody that's listening can call about any car question anytime. It doesn't matter what... Uh, you know what we're talking about we're here to help you guys and gals so whatever it is you need to ask don't not call because we're not talking about that right dave <laughs> anything you want to talk about other than personal problems yes we, we can get involved in some of those too but <laughs> usually bad advice but the the engine flush in our shop we use a bg product which is a professional product you can only buy it at shops um, and I don't know what you mean by a lot of varnish, if there's a lot of uh, buildup or just simply the blackness or uh, oil bil- um, film on, on inside the parts that you might see in the engine. Uh, Check or Auto and a lot of the auto parts stores sell a product called Seafoam. That's like the, mist- the miracle fluid. You can put it in the oil. You can put it in the gas tank. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, so it, it's I don't know that I – I wouldn't say that I don't recommend them. Some people are completely against any type of additive or, or stuff like that, but I think it's just fine. Put one in. Put one in. Go to the parts store. Go to your shop. But i go BG or uh, look at Seafoam. I tried those two. Well, we're going to sneak, sneak in Andy in Mesa on a 92 Dodge van. Go ahead, Andy, quickly. You're on Bumper to hey Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. i got a 92 Dodge. It's got about 220000 on it. Um, I, my en- check engine light came on. Um, my code red 27, which said something to do with the uh, fuel injector wiring harness. Um, in the meantime, I put a new muffler. I needed a muffler and a cat on it. Within about 10 days, my muffler, um, both ends of the weld, has blown apart. Turns out I've got too much fuel going through the exhaust unburned. Since then, I've changed my O2 sensor. But my light is still on. The only it runs pretty good. Uh, the only thing it does is if I'm driving, you know, maybe on the freeway, it'll sputter like it's like it's not getting fuel for a half a second and then kick back in. It feels like a fuel problem, but I'm not really sure. Don't know where to go from here. Well, I think that's a throttle body fuel injected van, and we've you, what really you need to do is find out what code 26 means. I mean, that's the old school. I haven't heard that code in a long time. And you check that code, the old Dodge, you just cycle the key three times, on, off, on, off, on, and get the code. It flashes at you. So make sure you've got the right code number. And then and then you've got to go through the diagnostic test of that code. It might be a circuit problem. You could have the fuel injector 
that's maybe out of range to high resistance to low resistance. There's a small wiring harness there that, that could short out inside the air filter housing. But that's a prime example of putting on an oxygen sensor. The oxygen sensor is just going to read what it sees. It's just the messenger. So don't don't always uh, don't kill the messenger, so to speak, all the time. Uh, just just got to get in and do some testing. That's all. Well, we're glad you could join us on this Father's Day weekend. Thanks, Peter, for running the dials. Remember never to text and drive. If you are in the market for a good auto repair shop, bumper-to-bumperradio.com. That's bumper-to-bumperradio.com. He is Matt Allen. I am Dave Riccio, and we'll see you next week.